This morning, uh, y'all, since y'all seems to be the operating word that I have this morning, is uh, we're going to begin a study in the book of John. And in this book of John, we're going to look at the life of abundance. Now, the, the Apostle John comes along. He's called the Beloved One uh, of the Lord, and, and he begins speaking to us. And when I, when I think about how we live life, so oftentimes, particularly you know, in Christian circles, uh, we, we live by what uh, some people would hashtag as, as spiritual memes. Now, some of you understand, don't know what a meme is. Buzzwords. Buzzwords, because I was asking my kids the other day, you know, buzzwords, and my uh, one of them said, no, that's, uh, that's kind of old, you know, you need to hashtag it as in memes. So spiritual memes compared to living with authenticity. Now, think about spiritual memes. There's all kinds of things that, that, we, uh, that we use to bring across our thought, to bring across belief, and I've got, I brought along just three memes with me this morning that are going to pop up here on the screen. And the very first one is, when you score a great parking spot, I know that was you, Jesus. I know there's there's people in this room that have praised the Lord for that one. Or how about this? When you're trying to find in the Bible where it says, like and share and God will bless you. I mean, you've seen that essentially all over Facebook, right? Right? Like and share, and you're going to be blessed. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, because I see what you post. And then, that awkward moment when the preacher looks at you while he's preaching, and you yawn. (laughs) Well, when John pins these words of his gospel... He's pinning words so that we not be at the place of yawning, but we be at the place of true authenticity. He begins the gospel by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made. It was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so here we begin with a darkness not overcoming. And God desires that our lives not be about the spiritual means, but they be about authenticity. And the Gospel of John leads us to that very thing. Now, when I attended school, I remember going into a new class at the beginning of the semester, waiting for that teacher to pass out, that professor to pass out, The all-important syllabus. Y'all remember the syllabi? And remember how you looked forward with such excitement? And a little bit of angst? Because it was going to tell you how many term papers you would have to write for that particular course for that particular semester. Or how many books you were going to have to read in order to get to the term paper. And when you begin your term paper, you're supposed to immediately identify the thesis. What is the topic and the outcome? What is it you're going to present? And this is exactly what John does, except he writes his thesis at the end. He writes out, here is the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is not simply to to say, in the beginning was the Word of God, but he says, this is the purpose of the book. Now, Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He said the purpose is that you would believe. I think at times we live as if we are a spiritual meme, rather than living with spiritual authenticity. John says, I've written the book including these particular accounts that you would believe. That you would believe. That you would not have a cultural meme that describes your life, but you'd have an authentic faith that flows from the depths of your very being as you walk before the Lord. You see, it matters what you believe. It matters who you believe. 
The world might say it doesn't matter who you believe or what you believe in. All that matters is that you believe. Yet God in all of his wisdom and God in all of his care for you, he wants you to know that there is something more than believing just for belief's sake. He wants you to know that uh, there's something more than an intellectual assent that says, yes, I believe that Jesus is a historical figure. He wants you to be persuaded to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and live with genuine authenticity. So we're not called to believe simply for belief's sake or to place our faith in faith alone. John appeals to this motive in his presentation of the gospel. He affirms that God the Father is vitally interested in you and in me. Think about that. Here we run around in our lives and we think, is God really that genuinely interested in me? I mean, there's been a lot of things that have happened this week, have there not? It's been a busy week. Monday night. What happened Monday night? I forget. But then I really enjoyed the testimony of Dabo. He says, I, I give all the credit to Jesus Christ. And, and I, 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 work with, I put my family and, and others before myself. And then that young quarterback, they were at, he was interviewed, how's this going to change your life? He said, my life won't change, I know my identity, it's in Christ. Powerful, right? But we look back and we think about the week and all the things, you know, our highs and our lows, our ins and our outs, and all the different things going on. And God says, I care about you. As a matter of fact, he states it this way in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And here he affirms that Jesus Christ came to give us eternal life, and that eternal life is an abundant life. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. God wants you to live with the abundance of life, not by a world definition, but by a spiritual definition. Jesus didn't tell the, uh, John didn't tell the whole story of all that he could concerning this word that was made flesh, concerning the life and the work and the teachings of the Lord. He omitted many things, but he was eager to share the good news so that people could come to know Jesus Christ both as Lord and Savior. You see, John, the beloved disciple, was an evangelist. And so he gives us seven signs, miracles, wonders, illustrations under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us get there. And the seven are these. I mean, if you were about... Oh, well, they just gave you the answer. I, I was going to say, if you were about to introduce yourself to the world... And the miracle working power that God has placed in you as the Son of God, I mean, what is better than turning water into wine? The occasion is, uh, is a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The family's got all these guests come in, and, and guess what? They ran out of wine. They ran out of wine. Man, you don't want to run out of wine when you've got everybody in for a wedding, right? And, and so... Uh, Jesus uh, is asked, what can we do? And here's what Jesus does. He turns the water into wine. You know, and, and here uh, he, he, he's doing something. He's showing actually care. You're thinking, what is the importance of this? He's showing a care so that the host family is, is not embarrassed, that they're unable, unable to provide. He, he made possible an increased joy on, on this kind of a festive and a social occasion. And he demonstrated his unique power over nature. But more than all of that, when Jesus speaks and he turns that water into wine, he shows us that he is the available Savior. He's available. You know, so many people that think of God as being far away and unavailable. They think his God is being distant and unapproachable, but he's available. And not only is he available, but he, he, he shows us his ability. 
Oh, yeah, we, we can grab a hold of that. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was, uh, was God. The Word was with God and made flesh dwelt among us by the Word. Everything was made that was made. We can grab a hold of that right. But it's hard for us to grasp His ability in our everyday life. But here we see His availability. We see His ability. And we see His desire to make the last better than the first. Now think about this. The first day of a baby's life. That baby's born, and all you grandparents are in there, you're oohing and you're on. I mean, that's the grandest baby that's ever been born. It's sitting there, but it's grand. You're so proud of it. And, and believe it or not, they did that over you too, you know? But Jesus makes the last better than the first. And the last day of life, as in Christ, the Bible says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We take on a new body because, you know, these bodies are born to die. We grow in them and, and they get older and we lose our hair. We gain wrinkles. Our stomach pokes out. And, uh, you know, our legs get weak and our eyes, uh, we have to squint to see. And our ears, hey, what would you say? You know, and all in all it goes. But when we enter into that eternity, it's better than anything we've ever experienced and greater than anything that we'll ever experience. To be present with the Lord and to be perfect and in the prime of life. And then the second thing Jesus does is he heals a nobleman's son in John chapter 4. There's a nobleman that, that came again uh, when Jesus was in Cana. And when this man heard, the Bible says that Jesus had come from the Judea to Galilee, he went to see him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. He had learned that Jesus was available, right? And he knew about Jesus' ability. And he knew that Jesus wanted to make the last better than even the first, perhaps. He says, Jesus, if you'll just come down, you're available, you're able, and you make the, the last better than the first. And Jesus didn't go, but he said to him, Go, your son will live. The Bible says that man believed that word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. He gets there, and he finds that his son is living. And so he inquires with the men that are there, When did he begin to get better? And they said, Yesterday at the seventh hour. And this father, uh, the Bible says, He knew the, uh, what the hour was when Jesus said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed in his entire household. See, Jesus revealed to us not only power, not only the power to turn water into wine, more than maybe some magician should, could try to do, but Jesus had power over disease. He, he, he cast that disease away. He had power over distance. This noble man's son was more than 20 miles away from where he and Jesus were having the conversation. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. And what we learn in this is, is Jesus has a compassionate concern for people with heavy hearts. You know, there are people in the room this morning who have heavy hearts. If your heart's not heavy today, it has been heavy. Or if it's never been heavy, it will be heavy. There will come a time in life when your, your heart will be heavy. Your burden will be great. The load will seem unbearable. But as we respond to Jesus in belief, we find that he lifts that load. Jesus... In the third place, he healed a lame man in John chapter 5. He, they're coming to the sheep's gate in Jerusalem, the uh, covered porticos. And it was there that they would lay people. The Bible says in John 5, in verse 3, the invalids, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And there was one man who had been laying there and placed there for some 38 years. 38 years. Couldn't you imagine? 38 years being placed there day after day, hoping without hope for something to happen. 
to get to the stirring of the waters, to be made whole and to be healed. And here was a man who was helpless and lonely and poor. He was helpless. helpless. He, he couldn't move fast enough. He was lonely. No one there to put him in the water. He was poor. He had nothing. 38 years. And a genuine Savior, a compassionate Savior, shows up and asks the man a question that we might even consider rude or harsh. He asked him, do you want to be healed? I mean, if it had been you or I, we'd say, duh! Right? Right? But Jesus asks this pertinent and important question, do you want to be healed? And I think Jesus was doing more than just being a showman. He wasn't just going from wedding to wedding, turning water into wine. He wasn't going from one hospital setting to another hospital simply to heal. But I believe in this setting, when he came upon that man who was hurting, hopeless, and lonely... I believe he was showing his compassion. He was showing that, that he had a concern, that he generally can, uh, you know, cared for those who feel hopeless and worthless. That he might speak to those and say to them, this is who I say you are. This is who I say you are. In the fourth place, we see Jesus feeding some 5,000 people. There's 5,000 that go out to hear Jesus talk, see what he might do that day. Obviously, it was the men who packed the bags to get ready for this great picnic because nobody had any food. Come on, guys, humor me. You know how it is. When they leave us responsible, we don't pack the bags, right? He asked the disciples, boys, what you going to do? You didn't, somebody left the bread and peanut butter at the house. Well, there's a young man, the, the disciples say, I mean, he's got five barley loaves and, and two fish. And the scripture tells us that Jesus took those five barley loaves and those two fish, and he blessed them, and he told the disciples to pass them out. And the scripture says, when the crowd had their feel. When the crowd had their feel, it's kind of like some of you guys look when you come to the coffee shop between the early Sunday school and the second worship service. And you're getting your fill of cookies and your fill of donuts and your fill of coffee. And then you're, you're satisfied and you come in here and you sit down and begin to sing. You're thinking, man, this is hard. I, my tummy's full. Ugh. Don't let me see you go to sleep now while I'm preaching. Or that meme's going to become a reality. It's not going to be me yawning or me you yawning. It's going to be you sleeping or something like that. Where am I going with that? <laughs> they had their feel. And, and then the Lord told them to take up all the leftovers. What's Jesus doing here? Well, in a in a, in a simple stretch, what we're learning right here is, is Christ is concerned and continues to be concerned with those that are hungry and unprepared. And with power, he's willing to meet the needs of those who are suffering. And greater than all that, I think it's a real lesson for us. Jesus has a willingness and a desire to use small things, two fish, five barley loaves to accomplish great things. Now, when I say fish, we're not talking about a 60-pound grouper out of the Gulf. You ever seen fish like they catch and sell over there in the nets? I mean, yeah, yeah, about like that. Big sardine. And a loaf of bread, we're not talking about these humongo, gigantic loaves, we're talking about little loaves of bread. I mean, 
Jesus using small things to accomplish great purposes. And you know what he speaks? That miracle speaks into your life, into my life. He takes our smallness. He takes our little things. And he accomplishes much. And he accomplishes bigger things than we could ever dream or hope or imagine. And then the fifth thing we see in this Gospel of John is Jesus walking on water. I mean, now he's doing something that nobody else can do. He perceives they're about to come and take him by force so as to make him king, and he walks on water. And the Scripture tells us here in John chapter 6 that that evening came, it was dark, Jesus withdrew up to the mountain to pray. The disciples go down, they get in the boat, they begin to row, um, and they go out three or four miles. Stormy, windy, blistery, cold, wet. And they're afraid, and they see Jesus coming, walking on the water near the boat, and they're frightened all the more. And Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. And here we see the Lord demonstrate his power over nature. We see him illustrate his power over the causes of human fear when he says, it is I, don't be afraid. You know, we have all these different fears that grip us and grab us and torment us and hold us and and keep us captive. And here Christ reveals his ability in the midst of that fearful storm of our lives, not only to reveal his availability to help us, but to overcome that fear. And what do we learn right there? We learn that Jesus sees us and he knows us and he knows about our fears and he knows about our insecurities. And he comes today and he walks across the sea of life to to where we are to help us in our time of need and to save us from the catastrophic, relentless abuse of fear. And then number six, we see him healing the man born blind in John chapter 9. And what we discover here is that Jesus Christ is the source of light and he's the the source of illumination. And, And what we can perceive right here is that we are all born blind in a sense. We're blind to the mercies of God. We're blind to the love of God. We're blind to the grace of God. We're blind to his care for us, to his provision for our hearts and for our lives, our souls and and our bodies. We're blind to these things. And yet Jesus comes and he illuminates this man's eyesight for the very first time. And so we discover that Christ is a source of real life because he's the son of God. And this blind man comes to understand Jesus. More, to be, more than being a man. And he, he grows and he calls him a prophet. And finally this man in John chapter 9 in the 35th through 38th verse, he says, you are the son of God. Now perhaps had we walked with Jesus through these six miracles, we would be pretty well convinced. We're starting out. There's a party, a wedding party. Turns water into wine. Man, that's impressive. That's so, so impressive. We continue along the way. And we we walk with the Lord as he heals a noble man's son. And then we see him heal the lame man. We, we see him feed those 5,000. We experience him as he walks up to us on the sea. And then we experience the scales on our eyes being pale, uh, peeled off. And we begin to recognize him as more than a man, as more than a prophet, as possibly even the, the son of God. But if those six are not enough to fully convince us. We come to the seventh. And a man named Lazarus is recorded in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 54. Lazarus is a, Lazarus is a good friend of Jesus. 
And he hears of Lazarus' sickness. And by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus is dead. He's already been in the grave. His family is weeping. The heart of Christ is touched. And with all the authority and all the power that we have not even attested to as to this point through the turning of water into wine, through the walking on water, through the healing of the lame, the, the opening of the eyes of the blind, with authority and the power of heaven's glory, Jesus makes this statement. Lazarus. Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And suddenly, the Christ has our attention. Lazarus comes forth. He's not covered in his Sunday finest, but he's covered in the wrappings of a dead man who's been buried for three days. He comes walking out of the grave. Death couldn't hold him because Christ had called him. He comes walking out of the grave alive, even though he was still tainted and somewhat scarred with the clothes of death. He came now walking out in life. And what we're to understand through these seven miracles and through this Gospel of John that we're going to dig into all the more in days to come is we are not on the road to death. Our first is not greater than our last. Instead, through Jesus Christ, we are on the way to eternal life. We are on the way to abundant life. Because God loves us. He said so. He showed us so. And Christ makes it possible for us that our life can grow and reproduce itself in others. And we too become the evangelist that John was because we believe. That we can come to the place that when we sit down to write our thesis on Jesus Christ, that it's clear and it's concise. Believe. Believe. Not in belief itself. Don't have faith in faith. But believe in Jesus Christ. This morning, you may have never trusted Christ Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. Right where you are, you can pray inside and say, Lord, I want to trust you. And, and, and you can say, Lord, I want to believe. But Lord, I, I still deal with unbelief. You know, there, I think most everybody in this room deals with some unbelief at times. And you can pray this prayer. This is what Thomas, one of the apostles, prayed. I mean, he'd watched Jesus as he turned water into wine, right? But when Jesus himself had been crucified, he didn't believe. And then when he came back to the place of belief, he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. We can pray that prayer. And Christ will enter into your life. Some of you God's speaking to and saying, this is a great church, and I want you to be planted here. Would you consider praying and maybe coming as we sing the song of decision, saying, Pastor, I want to belong here at Village. It may be that you have believed, but you've never been baptized scripturally. And you're ready to take that step of baptism. Whatever it may be, will you come? While our praise team leads us in this song of response, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us as you do. Oh God, we're grateful that your son Christ Jesus has shown himself to us in the evidences as recorded in the Gospel of John that we might believe. Lord, help us in this walk as we journey with you. Lord, help us not to live by the hashtag of a spiritual meme, but to live by the hashtag of authenticity. Lord, may you always be honored and glorified in our hearts as our decisions point towards you. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you come right now?